Right then, friends, please turn with me in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 3. This morning, I want us to have a little look at the first five verses. Now, accusations. We're all very aware, I'm sure, of the power of accusations, whether they are true or whether they are false. False accusations are difficult, aren't they? You know, we know in legal terms we are told that people are to be considered as innocent until they're proven guilty. But often that doesn't happen. When a false accusation is made, reputations are damaged, relationships are strained, people are suspended from work, all sorts of things happen. And the hope is that when the matter is investigated and the truth comes out, everything will be all right. But of course, we still do wonder that once an accusation has been made, a bad taste always lingers and people think there's no smoke without fire. But what about true accusations? False accusations is one thing. We can comfort ourselves in the fact that it's not true. But what if it is true? What if what's been said actually happened? And we actually did it. Now, in that situation, it's a lot harder, isn't it? There are fear of consequences. What will the wife say when she finds out? What will they do in work? How can I ever hold up my head again? And even if we're not found out, how can we ever live with ourselves? When our consciences accuse us, where can we hide? It seems as if all we can do is just slink away in shame. So that's the issue. It's a big issue, but that's the issue I want us to think about this morning, okay? In this way. How can a Christian, sinner as he is, ever hope to stand in the presence of God and ever hope to serve him? We're just sinners. Isn't that hypocrisy? I don't know if the devil's ever come to you and suggested that. He certainly has to me. And how about this one? How can any man or woman, when they start to be made aware of their sin, how can they ever hope to draw near and stand in the presence of a holy God? Surely God knows, and surely God will find us out. And when we are accused, we've got nothing to say. Now see, in those situations, the natural human thing to do is to hide away shame, paralysis, fear. But the work of our God through Jesus Christ means that it doesn't have to be like that. Because when the devil comes to us and he throws these accusations at us, accusations which are true, he often accuses us of things that are not true. But the big problem is the things he accuses us of that are true. When the devil comes and throws all those things about us, what are we to believe and what are we to do? Well, in this passage, we are told that there's another voice we need to hear, and we find it in verse 2. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now then, context. The book of Zechariah, uh, it begins, we're told, in the second year of Darius, the king of Persia. It's an Old Testament book, and the second year of Darius was 520 BC. In the book, the people of God, Israel, have been in exile with the Babylonians, the Persians. They're starting to come back from exile, but they've been in exile for their sins. That's why God sent them there. And when they come back to the land, they've got lots of things to wrestle with. And God sends Zechariah and other prophets like Haggai to speak to them and to help them, to encourage them that it isn't all over because of their past sins. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has a future for them. In spite of their past sins, they're not without hope. In the first six chapters of the book of Zechariah, there are eight visions where God is saying different things to his people. And in chapter three, we have the fourth of those eight visions, which is specifically designed by God to tell the people that sin and unworthiness, even when it's true and blatant, doesn't have to be the end of us. God himself 
has a solution to that, a solution that can bring forgiveness and peace, acceptance and hope. So am I on the right track this morning? Is this an issue for you? Are you perhaps not yet a Christian, but you're becoming increasingly aware of the fact that God sees you and he knows that things aren't right and you can't find any peace because God sees and it is true. And what can you say? Or are you perhaps a Christian this morning who's aware of your sin and aware of your failure? And when you go to pray, you're ashamed to call God Father. And when you come to the prayer meeting, you're ashamed to open your mouth. And when you have an opportunity to speak for Jesus Christ, you think, how can I, how can I ever say anything? See, these are very real issues. But this morning, what we need to do is to get hold of what God says. Right, accusations. Accusations are sometimes all too true. Now, in this passage, Joshua, Joshua is the high priest. As he's the high priest, he's the one who's called to serve God, and he's the one who's called to represent the people. But when he goes to serve God, Satan comes, and he opposes him, accuses him. That's what we read. <coughs> who's the accuser? Satan. And Satan means adversary. That's what the name means. He opposed God. He opposes God's people. Having rebelled against God himself, he now likes nothing better than to stop God being honored in people's lives and to stop men and women from knowing him and delighting in him. So when he comes and he brings these accusations, true as they are, he's not doing it to help us. He's doing it to destroy us. And we have to realize that. He's doing it to destroy us. Now, how does he do it? Well, he accuses us of sin. That's what he does. Now, the devil, we must never forget, the devil will throw anything at us that he can get hold of. Sometimes false accusations, you know? He'll throw a blasphemous thought or he'll throw a particular temptation at you and he'll try and persuade you that that kind of thing has come from your own heart. Like a cuckoo. A cuckoo who lays an egg in a nest so that the little birds will recognize it as their own and adopt it and think, there we are. That's what our family's like. That's what our nature's like. Look at this. Cuckoo's one of us. But no, the reality is in those situations that if we can recognize that that's a blasphemous thought, that's a temptation that's come from outside of us, our heart doesn't love it and we don't want to go there, well, that really helps us. That temptation has got different evil parentage. It doesn't belong to me. Great. But the real problem comes when Satan accuses us of things that are our own and that do belong to us. He reminds us of things in the past, you know. The things we've thought, the things we've said, the things we've done. He reminds us of the things we didn't say and the things we didn't do and the things we forgot about. And when he does it, we just recognize that the cap fits. That's true. That was me. That was my heart. That was my life. What can I say? See, it's normally things from the past that the devil uses. Joshua, here he comes, the high priest representing the people, the people who've been in exile because of their sin. Now that he stands up to serve God, here the devil comes and he throws it all at him. 70 years in exile, and now you think you can serve God? Really? Don't you remember the bloodshed when the Babylonians came? Don't you remember how seriously God took it? And now you think it's okay to stand and serve God? What is there from the past that haunts you? What is there that happened that when you come to pray or when you come to consider God, 
they rise up before your face as fresh and as chilling as if it was just yesterday. Sometimes it's not things in the past. Sometimes it's things in the present. How can you come before God and pray when your mind is filled with so many other things? How can you hope to serve God when you're so cold and so half-hearted? Half an hour ago, you were watching the telly. You're already thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. And as soon as the meeting's over, you'll be thinking about where to go on your holidays. See, what's the devil doing here? He accuses us of sin because he wants to prove to us that we are guilty. Too guilty to stand before God, accepted, and certainly, as Christians, too guilty to serve him. That's what he's doing. And he'll chuck it all in, whatever he can. But there's a second thing. He accuses us of insincerity. Your heart's not really in this, is it? The devil says. God says that Christians are to love the Lord their God with all their heart and soul and mind and strength and to love their neighbour as themselves. You don't love the Lord your God with all your <coughs> excuse me, all your heart and soul and mind and strength, do you? And you certainly don't love your neighbour as yourself. You're half-hearted, he says, if you're a Christian at all. And do you really think that a person like you with such a divided heart can serve God. And it's not just that, is it? He says, why are you doing it anyway? You're doing it because other people expect it of you. You're doing it to save face. You're doing it to gain a reputation. Is God really in it at all or is this just a hollow sham? And you see what he's doing? He's attacking our sincerity. He wants to prove that you're a fake. You're not really a Christian. If you are, not much of one. So how can you stand before God? And how can you ever hope to serve him? Now, I'm laying it on a bit thick, aren't I? But deliberately, because if you think this is bad, you know what the devil does to you. He accuses us of sin, and he accuses us of insincerity. And he even uses God against us. When he tempts us to sin, he tells us holiness doesn't matter. God doesn't judge us. He doesn't really care. Like he said to Eve, you surely shall not die. But when he comes to accuse us, boots on the other foot, isn't it? You know, don't you, he says, that God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. You know that your sins have separated between you and God. You know that the soul that sins shall die. And then he comes with a sledgehammer, even using the attributes of God against us. And he brings these frightening truths and he squeezes them on us. Now, why does he do that? He does that to destroy. He's not only an accuser and an adversary, but he's a destroyer and a murderer. The one who prowls around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. When he accuses, he does it to destroy you. It's not what the Holy Spirit does when he convicts you. When the Holy Spirit convicts you, he tells you the truth about your sin so that he might lead you to Christ and you might find forgiveness. That's what happened with Peter. When he denied the Lord and he was made aware of his sin and it drove him to the Savior. That's the Spirit of God at work. But with Judas... When the devil took hold of him and threw his sins in his face, it drove him from the saviour into despair and in his tragic case, ultimately, to suicide. Because he's a liar from the beginning, the devil, he would never tell you the truth about the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. And if it ever comes up, all he does is taunt you with it and say that may be true for other people, but it's certainly not true of you. The devil destroys. He destroys assurance. He destroys joy. He destroys thankfulness. He destroys faithfulness. He destroys youthfulness. He destroys lives. But notice this. Where does he do it? Verse 1. 
he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. He's in the presence of God. Now, as long as we're blissfully ignorant of God, the devil's got no need to rock the boat. As long as we think sin is no problem, we'll say, carry on, brother, carry on. Live for yourself. What's the odds? There's definitely no judgment and there's probably no God. But when we become aware of God, and particularly when as Christians we want to serve him, that's when the accusations start to fly. That was when Satan tempted our Lord Jesus Christ. After he committed himself to his work as our saviour in his baptism, the first thing that happened was that he was led out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Has God said? That's the way it is with us. Everything's fine until we come to pray. Then he accuses us. Everything's fine until we start to prepare our Sunday school lesson. Then he accuses us. Everything's fine until we try and speak a word to our family. And then he accuses us. You can't say anything. You were a bit angry half hour ago. What are you going to think of you? Everything's fine until we have an opportunity to serve, to preach the gospel. And then he accuses us. Everything's fine until we start to consider the reality of the gospel. And once we start to realise that there is a God in heaven with whom we have to do, a God who sees us and a God that we need to take seriously, then the devil comes in to accuse and to make out that there's no hope for us. That's what he does. Because he's the adversary. He's the enemy. He's the destroyer. He'll use lies and he'll use truth, but he'll only ever use them for bad ends. What he wants to do is destroy and cripple. It's awful. Who does he accuse? Well, he accuses us, doesn't he? In the hope that we'll shrink away. But we also have to recognise here that what he does sometimes is he accuses us to God in the hope that somehow God himself will turn away from us. Bear with me. This is, it's good to grasp this, right? Job chapter 1. Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? You've made a hedge round him and round his household and all that he has on every side. You've blessed him. You've increased him in the land. You stretch out your hand and touch him and all that he has and he'll curse you to your face. The devil is accusing Job to God. He's not really sincere. He's not really sincere. You should do something about it. That's what happens in Revelation 12. The accuser of the brethren who accuses them before God day and night. What does it mean? Think of what God has said. The soul that sin shall die. What does the devil do? He comes in and he says, hey God, you know you said. Hey God, look what they've done. How can you call yourself God and how can you be just if you let him get away with that? Do you sometimes feel that as Christians? You know something of the holiness of God. You recognise that something's happened in your life and you sort of think, how can I ever go on from here? Surely God is going to catch me out on this one. Surely God is going to do something. Surely he's going to judge me. Surely there isn't a possibility of more mercy. Surely now I've crossed the line and that's it and I've had it. That's why in Hebrews 2, the devil is described as the one who has the power of death. Not because he can kill, but because he accuses us to God, the soul that sins shall die. It's an awful thing. And our fear so often when we face these accusations is that we fear that God himself will look at us in our sins and that he'll turn away from us. And we'll stand like poor Joshua in the presence of God that we won't even be able to lift up our face. Am I resonating with you? Does that ring a bell? Right then. What's the answer to it? Verses 2 to 4. When Satan accuses Joshua, Joshua doesn't say a word. What can he say? Because the devil's speaking the truth. 
but the Lord speaks. And when the Lord speaks, he doesn't speak words of judgment and he doesn't speak words of disgust. What he does is he speaks in Joshua's defense. And that's key. He speaks in Joshua's defense. Our God is a God who is on the side of his people. He knows the truth about them and he's on their side. And he can do that and he can do that justly because God is a God who washes and who saves. Now let's look at that. He rebukes Satan. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. It isn't that Joshua is not a sinner. The Lord himself says in verse four, take away the filthy garments from him. He is dirty, you're right. And the word for filthy there, one translator puts it like this, disgusting muck, bit of a strong praise. God knows, God knows. He knows that there's dirt that has to be removed. He knows that. Joshua can't deny it and the Lord doesn't deny it. He doesn't sweep it under the carpet, not at all. But what he does is a couple of big, significant things. Number one, he acknowledges that sinner as he is, God knows him and he knows all about him. Verse two, the Lord who's chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. God's chosen him, sinner as he is. Jerusalem is God's people, Joshua's a representative of that. God's chosen them, sinners as they are. When he saved us, he knew all about us. He knew all about our past, all about our present, all about our future, all about our weaknesses, all about our habits, all about our hearts, all about our sins. None of those things stopped him when he chose us. None of those things stopped him when he saved us. And none of those things will make him abandon us now. Satan, I know, but I chose him. And then he goes further. He acknowledges that sinner that Joshua is, he's been saved. Verse two, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord that's chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now that's the point. And when the devil comes to us and the devil accuses us, that's the voice we need to hear. That's the voice we need to keep ringing in our heads. It is true, but this is true as well. Through Jesus Christ, by the mercy of God, am I not a brand plucked from the fire? Now, this old language, brand, is a stick, basically. It's a stick in the fire that's in danger of being consumed. But the point is, he's not in the fire anymore. And he's not in danger of being consumed anymore because God himself has come and God himself has snatched him out. Now think about that. Sinful people deserve the judgment of God. Of course they do. Sinful people deserve the reality of hell. We know that. I feel awful saying that to other people, but I have no problem saying that to myself. I don't know how you feel. But that's the truth, isn't it? That's the truth. But you know what? Even though that's true, the Lord has plucked us out. People sometimes, they start to experience the judgment of God in their lives, you know? Now, I remember when I was a small boy, um, playing drafts with my father. Um, and as we were playing drafts, I knocked one of the drafts off the table and he went into the fire. And my father came round the table and he knelt down and he got the draft out of the fire with his bare hands. And when he put it back on the table, it was a light wood draft with the black ones and the brown ones. And it was charred and black in places. I don't know if your life has been like that. But things have happened in such a way that you started to suffer the consequences. You can see the charring on you because the way of transgressors is hard. 
but isn't it true that at just at the right time the Lord stepped in and he plucked you out? And how much worse things would have gone if it wasn't for the grace of God in Jesus Christ at the right time? Brands. Brands is what we are. Well, that's true. Brands that will be consumed. That's true. But the Lord has plucked us out. Now, Romans 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It means the Lord Jesus Christ stepped into the fire and the Lord Jesus Christ took us out. It means the flames may have devoured him, but the flames won't devour us. John 5, verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. He shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Look how filthy you are. Yes, but the Lord has plucked me out. Jesus Christ has come, and he stepped into the fire, and he's plucked me out. And like one of Daniel's three friends, I can step out to the fire without even the smell of burning on me, because there's one with me, like the Son of Man. Now, what happens? What happens when he saves us? Well, he justifies us. He forgives us freely, which means all our sins, past, present, and future, are dealt with, and we can never be condemned for them. And I cannot stress that enough. It does not matter how much Satan accuses us or how true is what he says about us. The answer for his accusation is found in the once-for-all complete work of the Lord Jesus Christ for sinners. 1 John 2 and verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. The one who takes away the judgment of God. What's he saying? Yeah, you sin. Like a brand in the fire. But you have an advocate, Jesus Christ, one who comes into the situation and who speaks, and he says, Satan, shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. This is a brand plucked from the fire. There's an advocate in heaven who ever lives to make intercession for us. And how can he do that? He can do that because he's the propitiation for our sins. The devil says, Lord, it's not just, they sin. You know what they're like. And the Lord Jesus Christ says it is just. Because the punishment of God is satisfied against their sins in me when I bore their own sins in my own body on a tree. They've been plucked from the fire. But I went into the fire and I went through the fire. And I felt the heat of the fire. The first was such that if only I could have had a drop of water in those hours on the cross. But I went through and I died and I've risen again and I can pluck them out. Now there's implications for this, okay, that we have to get hold of. Here's the first one. The Lord will never condemn you if you're a Christian and it doesn't matter what the devil says. Romans 8 and verse 34. Who is he that condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Can you see how directly that's related to what's going on in Zechariah 3 and what the devil does? Who is he that accuses? It's the devil. Okay, but Christ is here. Christ is at the right hand of God to make intercession for us. And he can do that because he died and he's risen again. I have found a ransom. And people 
can go free. That's the first thing, all right? The Lord will never condemn you if you were a Christian, no matter what the devil says. Second thing is this. The only answer to an accusing conscience is found in the blood of Christ. We have to reassure ourselves, not that we didn't mean it, not that other people have done worse things. We need to get a grip there. None of that's true. We have to reassure ourselves with this fact, that the Lord Jesus Christ has stood in our place and the Lord Jesus Christ sets us free. And it's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. So you've got an answer to the accusations of the devil. It's true. It's true. But Christ knows, and Christ chose me, and Christ loved me, and Christ saved me, and Christ is on my side. And there's nothing you can do about it. If you're not a Christian here this morning, let me ask you this question. What answer can you give to all the accusations when they're true? If it's true that we've sinned before God, and God knows, if it's true that our sin sticks to us like mud, and we can't wash it off, what are we going to do? This is the thing the devil will never tell you. God knows. Christ came. Go to Christ. And just ask that he would pluck you like a brand from the fire. Because whoever comes to him, he will never turn away. Whoever puts their trust in him will never be put to shame. He is able to save to the uttermost all those who come to God through him. He is the one that can save you when you simply trust in him and who can announce to Satan and it can echo in your heart, I have plucked him like a brand from the fire. Can you see it? A couple of other things. The big thing that he does there, he rebukes Satan, absolutely. He rebukes Satan. The second thing he does in verses three to four, is he clothes the sinner with clean garments. See, in verse 2, I plucked him out of the fire, the fire of judgment. Forgiveness, deliverance from punishment, deliverance from hell. Praise God for it. He gives him a new status. He can stand before me. It's wonderful. But then in verse 4, there's more. Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said, See, I've removed your iniquity from you, and I'd clothe you with rich clothes. Right. How can you come and stand before God accepted? This is how. Our God clothes us with the righteousness of Christ. The last jargon, what does that mean? It means when we trust in Christ for salvation simply on the basis of the work that he's done on the cross for sinners, trusting nothing else but him, confessing our sins and throwing the weight of our soul upon him, believing his promise that if we trust in him, he'll save us. When that happens, what he does is that God the Father looks at us and he sees us with all the beauty that he sees in Jesus Christ, who lived for us and died for us. Not filthy garments, but the beauty of a life like Jesus Christ, the son of his love. There's a hymn, isn't there? How shall I, whose native sphere is dark, whose mind is dim, before the ineffable appear and on my naked spirit bear the uncreated beam? Old language now. But then he says this. There is a way for man to rise to that sublime abode. You can stand before God. An offering and a sacrifice, a Holy Spirit's energies, God will work in you. 
an advocate with God. Christ can stand in the presence of God, accepted and without fear. Of course he can. But so can everyone who's clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Verse 4. Who is the Lord speaking to? Second part of the verse. He says in the first part of the verse, take away the filthy garments from him, from Joshua. And to him, he said, see, I've removed your iniquity from you and I'll clothe you with rich robes. He tells Joshua, Joshua, I have removed your iniquity from you and I've clothed you with rich robes. I've done it. I've removed your iniquity. I've forgiven you. I've covered you. You were accepted. You can stand. Assurance. What's the basis of our assurance? It's Jesus Christ. It's what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. And if we can see some evidence of a changed life in us, something that Jesus Christ has done in us, in our hearts and in our lives, well, that just strengthens everything and that's wonderful. But it's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. If we are covered with his righteousness, we can stand. If our sins are taken away by his blood, we'll never come into judgment. And we can draw near to God and we can call him Father. And we are accepted by the God of heaven. I think that's a wonderful thing. And the last thing in verse 5, the result of all of this. Because a new person speaks in verse 5. So far, all the conversation has been between Satan and Christ, the angel of the Lord. They are the only ones that have been speaking. But then in verse 5, suddenly Zachariah pips up. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. How should a person respond who's been forgiven and washed and clothed and assured and made able to stand in the presence of God Zachariah can feel it. Let him stand in your presence and let him serve you. That's the fruit of it, you see. If we've really been forgiven, if we've really been brought back to God, if we've really accepted, what does it lead to? It leads to living your life for God. It leads to serving him. It leads to glorifying Christ and living for him that died for us. It's the same thing with Isaiah. Isaiah in chapter 6, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And an angel takes the coal from off the altar and touches his lips, and his iniquity is forgiven. And how does Isaiah respond? Lord, here I am. Send me. Why wouldn't you go? Why wouldn't you go to serve a saviour like that? Why wouldn't you go to tell other people about the fact that whatever the devil says, Christ has a voice that wakes the dead. Christ has blood that washes men and women clean. Christ is the one who's able to set us free. Why wouldn't we tell people that? If the Lord Jesus Christ is ours, then surely, surely, what he does is he brings us back to God. So here's our conclusion. What is the answer to the accusations of the devil when they're true? It's the blood of Christ. It's the blood of Christ. Who can answer the accusations of the devil when they're true? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, our advocate, who loved us and who washed us in his own blood. And who is better placed to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? than men and women who've been forgiven and who've been accepted and who serve him with a thankful heart. How are you doing this morning? The devil will come and he'll have a go. Trust in Christ. Shelter yourself in the blood. Look to the cross. Remember that Christ is alive. He can answer all the devil's accusations because he's been there and he's reached us and he's plucked us like a brand from the burning. 
Friends, if that's not true of any of you, go to Christ. Go to Christ. He can save you. And when he saves you, he'll keep you forever. Bold shall I stand in that great day, for who shall to my charge lay? Fully absolved from sin I am. You see that? Bold shall I stand in that great day. How can you stand and how can you lift up your head with everything that's true about you? This is why. Look at what's true about Jesus Christ, my saviour. If he's mine, if he's plucked me, if his righteousness covers me, and if he's changed my heart, I can stand with boldness because the Lord Jesus Christ has plucked me like a brand from the fire. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that you're a God who's true, that you speak truth. We thank you for your word and pray that you bless it to us. You know our situation, everyone. We pray, Lord, don't let us just drift in our lives, but speak to us. Give us the comfort and the assurance that comes from knowing that Christ is ours. Lord, we praise you for it. And where the devil is having a go and making things difficult and stirring people up and seeking to crush and to destroy, Lord, we pray, let them hear the voice of Jesus Christ. I have plucked them as a brand from the fire. Lord, in mercy, we pray, hear us for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.